Earlier this month, we hosted the third annual GMTK Game Jam, which is a game-making marathon where participants have to design, develop, and release a game in just 48 hours. That game had to fit a theme, and this year the theme was Only One, which encouraged designers to make games with only one bullet, or only one room, or only one button. The response was enormous, with well over 7,000 people joining the jam, over 2,600 games submitted before the deadline, and more than 46,000 ratings. It was more than twice as big as 2018's jam, and once again, the biggest jam on itch.io. In fact, it was so big that it temporarily crashed the site's servers, which was a bit uh, stressful, seeing as it happened in the last few moments of submission. But with a slight time extension and some technical help from the site staff, we got there in the end. And so, as ever, I want to send the jam off by showing the 20 games that I think are most deserving of note and attention. Unfortunately, I couldn't check out all 2,000 odd uploads, but I did play over 100 of the top ranking games to help find these personal favorites. So, without further ado, let's jump in to the rundown of the best games of the GMTK Game Jam for 2019, which is in no particular order. Lots of games in the jam went for the one projectile idea, like missile control, where you guide a bullet after it's shot, or unloaded, where you shoot a bullet but then draw it back to you with a big magnet. Of the lot, Kickashay is the best one I played. So, playing as this cute little ninja, you throw out a single shuriken per level, with the goal of hitting every red cube and turning them green. Once the shuriken is in play, it bounces off walls, rips through enemy turrets, and triggers explosive barrels. And your only control is to, well, as the name suggests, kick it. Walk up close to the shuriken and click the mouse button, and you can boot the spiky projectile and alter its trajectory. I don't know how it doesn't shred this dude's foot into a million pieces, but no mind. It turns the game into a deadly, fast-paced football match, where you're trying to keep up with your own shuriken and pinging it off in new directions to get around corners and defeat bad guys. Helpfully, the game has a little slow-mo when you get near the shuriken, so you can fiddle with the angles and line up the perfect shot. This is a really fun game and could easily be expanded into a full release. Well done to Casey, Boz, Weeks, and team. When you first play Projection, you might not get why it's such a high-ranking game in the jam. So, you move a circle to a yellow square, and you win. Is that it? But then, suddenly, the goal is impossible to reach, and you're encouraged to hit shift to change view. And at this point, you'll get to see what all the fuss is about. Turns out, this isn't just some rinky-dink 2D platformer. It's a 3D world, just you can only move on one flat 2D plane. So in this 3D view, you can shift the entire world about to get platforms and obstacles into more useful positions, then flip back to 2D and complete the stage. Sometimes you'll be bouncing back and forth between the two views, and you don't just pull and push the level on a single axis, but you can flip and rotate the 3D world however you like, though the controls are a bit fiddly. Ultimately, this is a terrifically clever game with huge amounts of potential, and I hope that creator Arthur740210, very catchy name, continues to work on this. One of the problems I find with tower defense games is, after you've put down a few good towers, you're pretty much set. The enemy force can't possibly get past your ironclad defenses, and you basically just busy yourself with upgrading your towers until the end of the round. Tower bag definitely doesn't fall into this trap, because you only have one tower. You plop this thing down in the path of a wave of enemies, and then when foes start approaching from another angle, you need to lift the tower onto your back and walk it over to the other side of the screen. To stop you from just sitting underneath the tower and waiting for the next chance to move, the game litters the map with collectible coins, forcing you to juggle between picking up loot and moving your tower. And when you have enough money, the only way to upgrade your single tower is to lift it up and physically take it to the upgrade tile in the middle of the map. You definitely do lose a certain amount of strategy by only having one tower, 
but you gain so much movement and dynamism by dramatically limiting the player's options. So maybe, in a post-jam version, the developers could see what the game was like with two, or maybe three, radically different towers. I'd like to see how that changes things. One of the biggest revelations of the jam, I think, is that limiting the player's options can quickly turn any genre into a puzzle game. A game where you can jump is a platformer, but a game where you can only jump once per level immediately becomes a tricky conundrum of figuring out when and where to utilize that sparse resource. We definitely see this in the retro dungeon crawler Castle Demon Stone, where you can only carry one item at a time. Instead of being a mighty soldier with a backpack full of swords, shields, potions, and magic spells, you have to think carefully and logically about which item you pick up and when. You can't keep a potion in your back pocket, but instead must navigate back to it when you're hurt. And suddenly, the game becomes a stealth experience because you don't have enough room in your bag for a weapon. It's a clever twist on things, and for anyone who has anxiety about over-encumbrance mechanics or leaving a potion until the very end of an RPG, this game should prove a cathartic release. Making a game with only one level might seem like an easy way to cheat the theme of this jam, but not the way that developer Captain Caruso does it. In level 1-1, you'll play through a seemingly simple stage as Normal Boy, a capable platforming hero who can jump, dash, and swim. The stage is easygoing, but there's clearly more to it than meets the eye. You next unlock Dive Boy, a character who can breathe underwater, but can only stay out of the water for five seconds. Now, that same level has a whole new feel, as you explore a secret submarine passageway that Normal Boy could never have seen. Sky Boy is different again. This dude plays the level upside down, revealing another secret route full of clouds and flying enemies. Each character has both advantages and disadvantages. Greedy Boy, for example, is very fast, but dies if you don't constantly feed him coins. While Dash Boy can dash farther, but dies if he touches the water. A single stage becomes a varied and challenge-filled playground because your avatar is constantly throwing curveballs. And because my mind often wanders to the topic of Metroidvanias, I started to envision a game where you'd need to play as different characters to fully explore one world. And one hero could modify the environment to make it beneficial to another, like having Normal Boy open a giant waterway for Dive Boy to later come along and explore. The potential with this one is infinite. Here's a lovely game with a French name I won't even try to pronounce. Let me just give you the English version, Peaceful Afternoon with the Paintings. This game gives you super simplified versions of famous paintings but with the colors all mucked up. Your job is to swap the colors around to match the real artwork. The problem is, you can only change colors by clicking on a colored block and then dragging out a selection box to envelop other blocks. When you let go of the mouse, all of the blocks in the selection turn into the original color. This limitation leads to tricky challenges where you need one color, but it's all the way on the other side of the painting, so you might need to screw up a bunch of blocks to get the color in the right place and then fix the mistakes later. Other times, you need to store a handy color in a safe space only to retrieve it later. You can't just swap colors randomly, you need to think strategically about your options. The game only just fits the theme, Developers Sasha Shari and Leo Lefebvre. What? You can't put a V there. Uh, the devs say the game only uses one shape, a rectangle. And that's true, so we'll let them get away with it because this game is just so elegant and effortlessly clever. And like it says on the tin, it is a peaceful game that's perfect for a soothing rest after trying to help hundreds of people submit their games to a broken website. Matt Glanville didn't know that his one-button game, Switch and Shoot, was the inspiration for this year's theme. I didn't know that Matt Glanville was going to be taking part in this year's jam, and neither of us knew that he'd end up in the top 20 with his game singled out. Funny how these things work. But I had to pick this because it's just so much fun. You are a sniper trying to take out an intergalactic criminal who has snuck into a crowd of innocent civilians. All you see is a shifting sea of faces and a handful of clues about the person's appearance, like their hairstyle, ear shape, or hat choice. 
You've got to try and find the person who fits this description and take them out. The faster you find them, the more points you get. It's a simple idea, but it works really well. It's tense, it works great in groups, and it's kind of funny too. My favourite touch is the tombstone that appears if you shoot the wrong person, to really rub in the fact that you're a complete monster. This game won't keep your attention for weeks, but it's a wonderful little time waster for a boring afternoon. There were other ultra-playable Where's Wally style games in the jam, like the very cute The Orphan Sock, but singled out's tombstone gag just clinched it for me. So, there are Game Jam games that have the kernel of an idea that could easily be expanded into a fully-fledged game. And then there are others that would probably never make it as a retail product, but the idea is just super fun to explore in a 10-minute freebie. Infiltration is one of those games. This is a hostage situation game, where you need to shoot terrorists while avoiding the hostages. The catch is, the CCTV cameras are on the fritz, and each one only shows a small amount of information. One camera shows your character, another shows the baddies, a third shows the hostages, and the final camera shows the environment. So you've got to flip between these cameras, trying to build a full mental model of how the situation is laid out, before committing to your shot. You've got bouncy rubber bullets that ping off walls and smash through windows, but are you sure that the bullet is going to bounce off the wall and into the terrorist's face? Or is it going to ricochet off in the other direction and injure a hostage? Better flip between the cameras for a bit longer. Like I say, this probably isn't going to go anywhere. The setup is as contrived as hell, and the novelty wears off quick. But I still had a lot of fun playing it, and spent way longer than I expected lining up shots and figuring out my next move. Which all goes to prove that intense restrictions on the player can lead to some really interesting gameplay. Intercom is a super smart game. You don't play as this poor, blind prisoner. You play as some omnipotent observer who can communicate with the prisoner through an intercom. An intercom that can only play a single sound. But with this rather limited line of communication, you can enter Morse code-like communiques to tell your prisoner pal things like yes, no, go, and jump. What I really like about this, and the thing that really propelled it onto this list, is that the developer lets you pick the codes yourself. Creator JJ Morgan could have easily pre-programmed the commands for you, but no, you pick them yourself. When the prisoner asks you to choose a sequence of beeps that means go, it's up to you how you hammer the keyboard to create the command. And once you've picked it, it's yours for the rest of the game. And this creates this wonderful juggling act, where you need to remember all of the different commands and sound them off at the right time. One for go, and then another for jump, and wait, what did I say for jump? Four short beeps, or one long one and one short one? With even more commands, it could get very complex. Sadly though, the game ends after only a few screens. Still, it's a lovely idea, and that simple act of personalization when making the beeps just gives the game so much heart and character. I would definitely like to see this expanded upon, just to see how manic the game gets when you've got to remember an entire lexicon of beeps and boops for commanding your unlucky prisoner. Next up is Hive Mind. This is a puzzle game where you control two characters with the same buttons, meaning if you hit left, both the green and the blue blob will go left. This instantly conjures up tough challenges, where you're trying to get them in sync before going through a goal, or carefully avoiding obstacles. Your eyes will be darting back and forth between the two screens, and you'll have to think carefully before making any moves. This is just a well-made game and a well-executed idea, and I can say I greatly enjoyed my time with these puzzles. It feels like no matter what the jam theme is, we'll always get games where you shoot to move. It literally happens every year. Maybe we should just make next year's theme shoot to move and get it all out of your systems. Still, these can be very good games, as proven by Cannon, a cute platformer where you have to blow yourself up with an explosive cannonball to shift about the environment. That's a clever differentiator from the other shoot to move games. Just blasting out the cannonball doesn't make you move. It's when the ball bounces back and hits you that you get the necessary lift to climb up towers and spring over gaps. 
This leads to really tricky moves like blasting the ball into the ground so it bounces back up and hits you in midair to lift you over a gap. That one took me a few attempts. This is just a fun, well-made game that shows how a platformer doesn't need jumping to be fun. Come at it from a different angle and you'll get something that feels unlike any platformer you've played before. One Action Heroes by Tapehead Games is a really smart bit of work. It's a teeny tiny puzzle game where each character only has one ability. The red dude can only move horizontally, the blue chap can only move up and down, and old green can grab a hold of nearby friends to move along with them. It's a simple setup that immediately gives way to clever conundrums. Red might be unable to reach the goal because it's not on his limited plane of movement, but Blue can launch himself from underneath and push both heroes into the finish. And Grabby Green has certainly got his advantages, but must be used wisely, else you also pick up pointless props like boxes. This game is eminently polished and could literally be released on Steam today, and no one would know this game was made in a 48 hour period. Make more levels, please. I didn't expect to see an effective horror game made in just two days, but here comes Lurking in the Dark, a creepy little number that is dripping in dark, foreboding atmosphere. The game is a step-by-step -step dungeon crawler where your flickering lamp only illuminates one tile ahead of you, meaning you must creep around to avoid falling into spikes and freaky monsters seemingly come out of nowhere. When you do see a monster, you can use your torch to your advantage. When it's on, the monster runs directly to your location. When it's off, the monster stays still. So it's a good idea to turn the light off, run around some spikes, flick the torch back on, and watch the beast wander into a trap. Only, when the light's off, you can't see the spikes yourself. So as you're first exploring, you're having to create a mental model of the space so when you're being chased by an angry monster, you can safely dance past all the hidden spikes and then flick on the lamp and turn the tables on your oppressor. This is a really clever idea and there's a huge amount of potential here for more light-based puzzles and mechanics. Well done to the creators. Another one bullet game now. This time we're facing off against an evil army of ever-expanding polygons, and the idea is to rip through their gooey bodies, splitting them into smaller shapes and chowing down on their tasty vertices. One of the things I really like about this is the way it subverts the usual mechanic as seen in God of War and Titan Souls of having your projectile magically return to you. Instead, you fly towards the bullet, which rapidly snaps you about the battlefield. And this can lead to all sorts of fun strategies like quickly darting out of danger by warping towards your bullet or flying behind an enemy for a flanking backstab. Another great thing about this game by Barber and team is how it has an undulating difficulty. Bigger shapes are easier to hit, but harder to fully kill, while single lines only take a single bullet to murder, but are extremely tricky to actually strike. As the shapes fall apart, the game's challenge changes in a clever way to keep the gameplay fresh and exciting. Nice. There were a number of comedic games in the jam, like a game where you must delete an asteroid, a game where you generate doors and kick them into aliens, and a platformer where every texture is, uh, my face. My favorite though is Only One Minute Before Restart, a game where you're almost finished writing an important email, when an automatic update tells you that your computer will restart in one minute. You can try to delay the update so you can save your work, but the computer has a few security checks to go through. What happens next is a farcical series of tests and checks from simple passwords and math quizzes to full-on minigames. It's a really silly, minute-long joke, but I enjoyed it a lot, and the ever-expanding absurdity of the situations gave me the biggest laugh of the jam. Kudos to the creators. Someone asked me in the YouTube comments the other day, how do you come up with a good platformer mechanic, as good as something like the dash in Celeste? Well, here's one, courtesy of the game Soul Ward by Gumboot. This is a charming platformer, where you can throw out a shard and then instantly warp to its position, throw it over spikes, up impossible towers, past obstacles, and through enemies to make progress. There's also a clever idea that while you're holding your shard, you're invincible, but when the shard is out, you are completely vulnerable. There is something I like about these projectile chucking games that constantly switch the feeling of play between powerfulness 
and powerlessness in a super dynamic way. Anyway, this game has a few issues where your shard goes off the camera and you have no idea what you're going to warp into, but aside from that, this is a really nice idea for a platformer and could definitely fuel some smart levels, enemy encounters, and puzzles. The first level of Chicken Hike is easy. In this game, you must draw a line to create a walkable platform for a wandering bird. And here's the solution. Bang. Done. But then, level 2 is a lot tougher, because we can only use one line per level. Like I said earlier, limitations create great puzzles. There's just so much to like about this game. The way it uses gravity and physics to make you think about momentum, the sketchbook graphics, and an input that's so simple anyone can pick it up and play. I wish I could have got past this level, ideas in the comments please, but a little more time for playtesting could create a very smooth difficulty curve of clever conundrums to work through. Top marks. Block Steady by Gustav Kilman takes a moment to get into. You see, you're on these perilous platforms and you've got to bonk these enemies to kill them, but this creates a chain reaction of explosions that rip the floor out from beneath your feet. You've got to be in, well, relative safety by the time the last block drops to see the next stage. Ultimately, you need to still be on screen when there's only one block. Happily, the game sports wonderfully tight controls and a zippy, lightning-quick pace, which makes it really fun to leap through enemies, bound up walls, and jump from enemy to enemy. And again, there's a small puzzle element to proceedings, because you can't just jump on foes at random because the floor will start disappearing beneath your feet. You need to think carefully about what path you'll take, which will lead you from enemy to enemy, while also keeping you a bit of security to stand on. Clever stuff. There was a number of games in the jam where you only get one jump per level. My favourite execution of the idea was Happy Accident. Here, you get one Celeste-style dash, which you direct by aiming the mouse, and one jump, powered by the spacebar. Between these two moves, one super analogue, the other very digital, you've got to get your gooey hero to the finish line. At first, I thought the paint streaks were just a nifty aesthetic choice, but no. They're a handy indicator of where your last shot went, giving you the tools you need to make slightly different trajectories. Again, there's a real puzzle aspect to proceedings, which causes you to pause before every shot. Overall, this submission from Cryptic Silver Games is well worth trying. And finally, I really enjoyed the puzzle game Buddy System by Prodigal Son Games. It's about a pair of robots who share the same power cell. Whichever one has the battery can move around and then throw the power cell at its buddy, who then catches it, switches on, and takes control. The two robots must stand on their respective platforms to finish the level. That's easy enough in the first few stages, but then obstacles start appearing that force you to switch back and forth between the two bots and then start bouncing the power cell off walls to ping it around corners. There are all sorts of clever ideas like buttons that open and shut doors and conveyor belts, giving the game a surprisingly large number of stages for a 48-hour creation. But that's not the point. The point is this is a clever puzzle game that immediately suggests all sorts of ingenious interactions and consequences, and I could happily play this sort of smartly designed game for hours. So that is an incredible amount of innovation for just 20 games. But of course, there's a lot more that I could have talked about. So please head on over to the itch.io submission feed to see all of the games for yourself. A link is in the description. I hope everyone had a great time with the jam. Even if you didn't end up in the top 20, I'm certain that you learned something new about making games, or found someone new to collaborate with, or enjoyed chatting with the community on Discord or got your first taste of actually finishing and uploading a game. And so I hope you'll join us next year for GMTK Game Jam number four. I wanna give a special thank you for your feedback on this year's jam. We've definitely got a lot to learn and we'll be putting your ideas into practice in 2020. For starters, itch.io has promised that it's got the problem under wraps and tells me that it can now withstand any jam of any size. Next year. Let's put them to the test.